On va commencer d'abord, donc je ne vais pas être très long dans la présentation de Joshua Pierce, puisque vous avez bien vu la, la description de son CV euh, et, et surtout les travaux euh, assez transversaux qu'il mène. Donc, so, so thanks again, Joshua, for being with us. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, it's the first time Professor uh, Joshua Pierce is here in Nancy, hopefully not the last. Um, so since yesterday we were sharing experience from his lab in, the, uh, in his laboratory and then we are trying to share our experience because in the open source world there is so many things to do and the more we discuss, the more we are opening windows. Uh, so Professor Joshua Pierce is coming from Michigan Tech University. So he's at uh, the moment on the Fulbright uh, Foundation uh, Fellowship in Aalto University in Finland. And so that's all now up to you. And thanks again for being with us. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. It's truly an honor. I'm now extremely jealous of this facility. <laughs> so I will try to, to take it back to the US and, and make some good things happen. So what I'm here today to talk to you about is how 3D printing, even the lowest of low-tech 3D printing, can be extremely valuable to scientists to do real scientific work. Now, scientists have made their own hardware since probably the first scientist. This is an example from my PhD thesis on exactly how not to design scientific equipment. It took me more than a year to do this. It's using a bunch of very expensive components, but they never, none of them work together. They're from different companies. It was very difficult on the software side. It has multiple computers running it. And what it's doing is it's the one of only two machines in the world that could scan the, the defect states inside a semiconductor band gap to see what was causing the semiconductor not to work well. And my, my research was on making solar cells more efficient, and we, we would put these solar cells in the sun, and they would, their efficiencies would drop. And for 25 years, people have watched this happen. And of course, that's the worst thing in the world that could happen to solar cells for it to degrade when light hits it. Um, and they basically had come up to it with one theory because it was what they could measure. And what this device does is it scans through the entire energy gap and picks out different defects. And as you can see from the graph there, there's more than one thing happening. And knowing that there was something else in there, we found some ways to, to solve that problem and we got more efficient solar cells. Now, making this piece of equipment took a long time took a lot of relatively expensive components. And there's two other ways that you could go about doing it. One is if it's available commercially, you can buy it. Anybody that's bought anything from a scientific supply house for any project knows that you get ripped off. You can easily spend more than you can spend on your house buying a relatively simple tool. By simple, I just mean that the physical thing that it does is really simple. In this case, we're shining a light through something that changes the color of it, chopping it, and then measuring an electrical current that comes off of it while also shining a second light on it. So nothing here is complicated, but actually getting it to work right is extremely complicated. And then the other option that you have is the, the custom make it. So you could pay someone else to make you a new scientific tool that's not available, but then you're going to pay extraordinary amounts, $10,000 just for the engineer to look at your problem before you even get started. And so this is basically what we're, we've been stuck with. You could buy something off the shelf, you're going to get the same tools as everybody else. It's very hard to do new science. You can make it yourself, but that'll cost money and a lot of time. Or if you have a lot of money, you might have a, a shot at getting someone else to do it for you. And now we have a new way, the, the open source hardware way, where we can really build off of the strength of past users, past developers, to make something new much, much faster. Now, the uh, probably, well, most people, if you're in this room, are already at least semi-familiar with open source. But if, if you're not, what you're most familiar with probably is software. So the Linux operating system that now drives all of the major internet companies from Amazon to Facebook to Google, everything on the back end is open source. And the reason they're using it is not just because it's free and they can download it and get it with no cost, it's because it's better. And the reason it's better is thousands of people have put in time. So no matter who you are, and no matter how powerful your company is, you can only hire a subset of the population. You can't compete with all the rest of us. And so when you have everybody hammering on a problem, you get a better solution. And that's what Linux has done, and then that's spilled all over to basically all the other types of software. And now if you're a software developer, the standard model now is to use open source. And just because it's open, doesn't mean that you can't make money off of it. And the best example is, is Red Hat. It's a multi-billion dollar per year company <coughs> uh, from the States. 
they make their money selling something that all of you right now can download for free. You're allowed to burn a, a DVD and you can go sell it on the street corner. So it's completely free, but they still make billions of dollars because they're selling a service around a free software package. The service is they guarantee it will work. So if you're a bank and you absolutely have to have your servers working at all times or you're losing millions of dollars, you shelf out some money to them to make sure that it keeps going. And they've made a very successful business off of that. And then all, a lot of these other ones, all companies or projects you're probably familiar with, they're open source software and it's better a method to develop technology. Now in the early days of open source, people thought that you could only make it with, with software because the, the transition cost to, let's say, copy a program or email it to your friend is basically zero. And hardware, especially even the, the most hardcore, like, uh, open source developers thought you couldn't do it in hardware because hardware costs money. You have to have physical atoms, you have to have tools that actually make things. Um, and that's going to, to add a, a barrier that you can't get over the same way you can with software. But now with digital manufacturing tools like laser cutters, um, 3D printers, uh, we can overcome that. And the, the first kind of open source hardware project that really took off is the Arduino. It's an Italian microcontroller project that came from a design institute. And it, the designers, they were mostly artists. And the idea was they wanted to train their art students how to have uh, like kinetic sculptures. And anybody that worked in microcontrollers, say 20 years ago, can tell you it was really hard. Programming a microcontroller to say move a robot hand as a PhD thesis, it would take years to be able to pull something like that off. With an Arduino, I can train my third grader how to do it in an afternoon. And the only reason that we can do that, besides there's like, smart kids, is the, the software, the hardware, everything has been worked out before. So this open source microcontroller, the, the cheapest ones are on the order of 20 bucks. The code, the schematics, the electronics, the firmware, the software, all of it is free and open. And the, that Art Institute, once they kind of developed an easy way for their students to do it, unfortunately for that particular Art Institute, is it was going bankrupt. And the professors, rather than kind of watching the project kind of crash and burn, threw it up on the internet. And anyone that knew anything about microcontrollers at the time was like, oh man, they really have something that's going to be really easy to add to this. And that's what happened. So all over the world, thousands of people have contributed to the code, to example libraries that have made it really easy to do any microcontroller project today with this. Now, people have been doing things like, um, Auto lawn mowers that are completely automated that cut your grass for you and making kind of cool little games for children. Uh, but then the scientific community started catching on. And so they started messing around with it a little bit and realized you, you couldn't make the best oscilloscope on the market, but you could make a pretty good one for 20 bucks with a couple of electrical contacts using relatively easy uh, to code software. And then the biologist said, hey, well, we can make a pH meter out of it. And if you look at the way this Arduino is set up, it has a shield on top of it. So if you need additional electronics that don't come with the original microcontroller chip, it has a geometry that's the same for everything, so you just click it on. And so if I make a new device that's based off the Arduino, I can make the shield library available to everybody so that anyone that has the ability to manufacture electronics, whether it's a company, whether you just buy one from China um, off of the internet, or if you fab it yourself, now everyone could do it, and they can also commercialize it. And so now, if you would like an, uh, an Arduino pH meter, you can buy one uh, off the internet for a very small amount of money. And if we can do pH, well, you can think about starting to log it. So on the left-hand side, it logs pH, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen reduction potential, and temperature. And so now this is starting to get to a real scientific tool that maybe you'd monitor a biological experiment with. Uh, and then people started to commercialize products that were built off of it, so the open PCR, uh, you know, if you need to replicate your DNA for any reason, you can now do it for $600. You're placing thousands of dollars of commercial hardware with something that you can build here in the Fab Lab. Completely open source from, from nut to bolt to all of the software, and it's all based off the Arduino architecture underneath. Now, of all of the Arduino projects, the one that I have found kind of the most inspiring and the most uh, really truly innovative was building a 3D printer with it. And so, the, so the thing that makes this 3D printer special is not that it could make a three-dimensional object. There's just bunches of ways to do that. It's the idea that it was open source and it was specifically designed to print itself. So the goal of the RepRap project, or the self-replicating rapid prototyper, is to make copies of itself. And so these are the very first two, uh, the parent and the child. 
And I, I, I'll be the first one to tell you, and has anybody worked with the first generation of RepRaps in this room? I mean, actually, a couple. They were terrible. It was the worst <laughs> 3D printer on the market by far. It was just atrocious. But they realized that by sharing the idea, people would start to build off of it. Mm -hmm. They also realized patenting something where you buy one and then people can make copies of it is sort of a stupid idea. And so they put it up on the web. And right about when that happened, um, that's when I was looking for rapid prototyping capabilities that didn't cost a lot of money. And I immediately saw, like, as an engineer, if you don't salivate when you think about being able to make anything yourself, including the tool, um, you may have not be an engineer. And so uh, I jumped on, and it wasn't just me. Hundreds of other people all over the world jumped on. So the way these things work is you send a software signal to the 3D printer, it melts plastic in a very thin layer, say 100 microns, moves up the next 100 microns, and then traces out the pattern, and you can build up a completely two-dimensional object. And what was really remarkable about this is rapid prototypers have been around for years. They were extremely expensive. The, the one that I had access to at the university was over a quarter million dollars. I only had access to it once I was a professor because it was so difficult to work with. It was so expensive that you, know, you never let a, a student actually work with it. And you might have rapid prototypers at the major corporations, the Fords and GMs of the world. Maybe one, each university might have one, but they were not common. And the reason they weren't common is it was patented. It was extremely expensive. Uh, you couldn't even use the term, the fused deposition modeling was trademarked, so you could own that only refer to Stratasys branded 3D printers, and you only Stratasys was al and allowed to have a hot glue gun that would melt plastic into a three-dimensional shape. Anyone else that did that would be immediately sued and, and buried. It's not that Stratasys had bad engineers. They, had pretty, they still do have pretty good engineers. Some of my students work there. They're good, solid engineers, but they were extremely restricted in what they could do with it, and they were always worried about having an exact replica of whatever they were trying to do. So there was no, they weren't able to experiment in sort of uh, adventurous ways. They always had to stick within the box. And so the cheapest, the least expensive version they had on the market was $20,000, and it could do no better than any of the 3D printers that you had next door. It was kind of a not good uh, rep wrap by current standards. Uh, the feedstock was proprietary. You could only buy materials from them. Even if it was ABS, you had to buy Stratasys ABS, and you could only put Stratasys ABS in the machine, and it, it cost like 100 times what it, it, it should. And in my particular case, what I was trying to do with it was um, MIT had these one laptop per child, and at the time, it was revolutionary. The idea is you'd have a $100 laptop. Every kid in the developing world would get, a, get one. You'd put on free software, and we'd educate everybody. And a hundred dollar laptop now isn't very impressive, but at the time it was like fantastic. It had mesh networking, it was a color screen, it was as good as we could do. They took it out into the field and then realized, oh wait, people that we want to get this to the most don't have access to electricity, shoot. So my group does solar cell stuff and so we were like, well we could make an integrated photovoltaic case that would clip right onto the laptop and it would be great. And we got the rapid prototyping machine, had it all designed, 65 bucks. Remember the whole computer only costs a hundred. So it was way more expensive than the electronics and the solar cells, and it's just plastic. And so I started looking around, and I found the RepRap, and this was the first one my group made. It was acrylic um, laser cut, and it, was, it broke. So the, the very first time, we got it all together, finally, and it broke printing its first thing. So I had my two students hold it together at the corners and print out the replacement part to fix itself, and the printed part was better than what we started with. And so in the RepRap community, you get innovations every day. Every day, there's somebody somewhere around the world making a slightly better version. They post it up on the web, and then everyone has the opportunity to take that innovation or not. If you think it might help your particular project, you download it, print it out, and make it better. And so you get weekly or daily improvements, the cost of the 3D printers just plummeted. Uh, today, you can go to many dozens, even probably 100 companies at this point, and buy a good, solid 3D printer that, had, that could do everything that the Stratasys printers could do uh, for under $100. There's a, a little kit that you can buy in Britain that's 99 bucks. You can build a pretty good one for 500 And if you get one of the professional grade ones that comes out of the package, you plug it down, stick in your USB, that's going to be on the order of a couple thousand, 2000 to $3,000. 
Uh, the feedstock is what plastic costs, or in the most extreme example, like next door, you can recycle plastic, which costs nothing, and it's on the order of 10 cents a kilogram for the energy to turn recycled plastic back into 3D printing filament to then be able to print with. And so my solar test case, just using commercial, highly <coughs> marked up feedstock was down to $5, and now that's starting to get to something that's interesting. And if you use a RecycleBot technology to make waste plastic into the feedstock to do it, it's under a dollar. And so it's, it's getting to the point where it's close to free. And so this was very nice for this project. And my group sort of started to, to split, where we did some solar cell research, and then we started to do more and more 3D printing research. And we, we really got we, got, we caught the bug. So this is the second one that we built um, in my group. And the first one took two students a summer to build. This one took one student, Brennan here, one semester to build. And you can see it's using the same electronics as it's an Arduino with a shield that's controlling the stepper motors primarily that make the RepRap work. And if you look at this design, it's using less parts than the, the previous one. It's a simpler design. It's using more 3D printed parts. All the blue parts and some of the red and white parts are, are all printed. And it's better in every technical way that you can think of a 3D printer. It prints faster, it prints in more materials, it, it costs less money, it make, takes less time to build, it's more um, reliable, it's superior. Now, we had a little bit to do with this, but so did lots and lots of other people. So we're getting ideas from all over the world, and you can see some of the, the interesting ideas that work so, so great in the, the long run, things like printing out plastic springs so that you would get good quality adhesion to the first layer of your print. So this was okay, but still pretty frustrating to, to deal with. And this is when sort of um, 3D printers of the RepRap origin became truly useful to a scientist. So um, my lab does solar cell work. A lot of it involves shining different colors of light on a solar cell to see how they react. And to do that, we have a filter wheel changer. And all a filter wheel changer is, is something that rotates, puts filter in the path of the light, shines it on the solar cell. Very simple. Ours broke cost $2,500, which isn't like, it's not that much money, but what was really irritating, it was a five month lead time. And this was right at the beginning of the summer when we get our most work done. So like taking a five month break from doing solar cell research or having my students sit there and put filters in by hand, like that's insane, it would have been a complete waste of money. So what I did is I hired a high school student and the high school student designed this. And this is an automated filter wheel changer using an Arduino and completely 3D printed that costs 50 bucks, and the majority of the cost is the Arduino itself and a little bit of the electronics. And it is superior to every filter wheel changer on the market by far. Why? Because it's completely customizable. It was written in OpenSCAD, which is a script-based CAD package, to be parametric. So if you want to change the size of the filters, the number of filters, the shape of them, all of that is one line of code that you just change a number on, and it immediately pops up. What also is kind of beautiful about all of this is this computer is a discard from Michigan Tech. I suspect they do the same things here where undergraduates get really good computers and then when it's not good for the undergraduates anymore it gets passed to the grad students and when it's not good for the grad students then they either throw it in the garbage or they say you can pick it up for free. So that's what we did. Grabbed a whole big bunch of these computers. Some of them we just took apart and we stole like the power supply to run build the rep wraps off of. The other ones we put on Linux. So we took something that was barely functional as a computer with Windows on it resurrected it with Linux so you could actually use it for complicated things like CAD, and then started to use them in the labs to drive our RepRap 3D printers. And so this printer, again, is using less parts, easier to build, more reliable, faster, cost less than all the ones before it, and it's completely based off of open source code that is shared with everybody else. And so putting all of this together, now you can have a fairly good optomechanical lab that you make with mostly trash, and you can put together in a couple days. And so this is when I was like, oh man, we're onto something. Why would I ever go back to buying stuff off the shelf that can't be made custom because I can get high school students to do a better job for me for the cost of a high school student, which is in, in the US at the time was like six bucks an hour. It's <coughs> probably more expensive, but it's still nothing in the, the grand scheme of things. And we get better equipment that we can make ourselves to meet whatever needs we have. As we got better and better at making the 3D printers, this is a, a Delta bot, and this is the basic structure of how all, all the 3D printers in my lab work today. And this was based off of a German design. It's a, more or less a pick and place robot that they put a 3D printer head on the end of. And what's remarkable about this is you can build it in eight hours. And so now we took something that only a couple years ago was taking in, you know, a couple people an entire summer to something you can do on a lazy Saturday afternoon. It's $500 for the, the complete 
um, if you buy all the parts separately, but then if you, for example, if you have access to a fab lab and you can 3D print all the 3D printable parts and cut out the wood, it costs even less than that. And by this time, it started to become obvious that we should start to scale this because our lab was only able to make so many of them. So I ran a class, and if anybody is interested, all of the materials for the class are available for free online. Uh, it's completely open source from the lectures to what we do, and every student in the class makes a 3D printer that they get then get to keep. And the way, and actually, sort of interesting to think about the Finnish, or the, the French and Finnish models, the European model versus the American model. So in the US, you pay extreme amounts of money to go to school. And everybody, more, most everybody, takes out loans to be able to do it. So college students are very poor. They can't afford things like <coughs> printers. And so the way that I got this to work is I had a course fee for $500 that they could put on their student loans to then get the materials to build a 3D printer that they then get to keep with their, for the rest of the time. So this class was, or still is, extremely popular. It's always overbooked. There's more students that, can, that, like, that I can hold in the room. And it's really changed the way the campus works now. So if you want something rapid prototyped, there's probably somebody in your dorm that's already built one of these. And the, usually the first thing they start printing is through the 3D printed parts for their friend or their dorm, their roommate, because they want one too. And so we were a very heavily engineering school, so everybody that you see in that picture is some type of engineer. Um, very excited to, to get them working the first day. Now with that, we started to look at what else we could do with them. And once you sort of control three-dimensional space, um, plastic might not be good enough for you. So maybe you need something in high temperature, so you need to be able to print a, a ceramic. So you can make a 3D printable syringe pump that you then mount to your uh, Delta bot, and it can either print in plastic, sort of in the down mode, where the substrate is just a piece of glass, or you can print in the up mode, where these carriages have magnets on the, t the top and bottom, and you just switch these tie rods up to the top, and now you have the substrate moving instead of the extruder head moving. And so using a syringe pump, you can now start to print out ceramic and move the, the substrate underneath uh, what you're printing. Uh, you can also put on a, a mill, and if you do that, then you can start to mill out your own circuit boards to make your own custom circuits to build, say, the shield that you need for your next Arduino project. And if you look at this, uh, one of these, these are magnified views, one of them is a professional uh, PCB mill, and one of them is ours. And if you look very closely, you can tell which one's which. But it doesn't matter because ours is good enough to make every single electronics project we've already ever wanted to build off of it, and it's built off of this platform that's the base cost is $500. Um, the real beauty is that anyone now that wants to can replicate anyone else's scientific equipment that they've made open source. And that means all of us can take whatever we're doing and sort of accelerate it because you start where the last person left off. And so the, the cartoon view of how this works is you have one scientist do something simple, um, like make a, a little sample holder for, say, a chemical experiment. But then the next scientist, because the, the geometry for this is already done, it's pretty easy to do the, like the next step and make, say, a, a test tube holder or to make a centrifuge. And because the way that you share open source hardware is the same with software, is that people can do whatever they want to it. They can change it, they can modify it, they can use it, they can sell it. They can make copies, but the, it all comes with a viral license, which says that if you make a change, you must share it with the rest of everybody else using the same license. And so because scientist number two and scientist number three had to upload their designs, then scientist number one has much, much better, higher value designs that she didn't spend any time on. And that's the real trick, is that you get people to do your work for you. So my lab is extremely uh, prolific compared to other labs at Michigan Tech. And like, other professors would come to me like, how do you do all this stuff? And it's like, well, I don't actually do all this stuff. I have a bunch of people that I've never met working for me all the time because I shared my code. And that's the secret. That's why you share. It's because it will help you in the long run for sure. So it's happened to our lab dozens and dozens of times. So that cartoon actually happened in real life. Simple design for a little test tube holder. And now let's say you need a centrifuge. And so there's a couple of nice little desktop models, there's some high speed models, and let's say you're just on the super, super cheap, there's the Dremel Fuge. So the Dremel is just a hand powered drill, you probably have one in your garage. If you connect this chuck, which costs, I don't know, like a nickel to print, to it, you have an ultra centrifuge. That's replacing hundreds of dollars of equipment, and it really is just as good. Now it's slightly unsafe, you should do it in a bucket, you wouldn't want to do this with your million dollar samples, but 
it's good enough to do a lot of nice work with. And these ones, th this is actually an older version. The, the newer version is now completely encased, all 3D printed, and for your centrifuging purposes, it's definitely ready for showtime. Um, other people started to catch on to this, and you can see the theme that is running through many of these example slides is a scientist got angry because they were getting ripped off. Magnetic test tube racks are not any more special than normal test tube racks, except they have magnets in them. They cost $600 a piece. So somebody at Berkeley got angry and bought a bunch of magnets on Amazon, 3D printed the rack, stuck it in it, and these are like you know $6 for a package of 10 or something. And you can print these two magnet racks justify the cost of the printer. And you can do more fancy ones. And now there's bunches of different designs and you can put your name on them and make dragons out of them or do whatever you want. And that's the beauty, is because once they posted this design, no one else should ever have to buy a magnet rack <coughs> ever again unless there's some real important reason, like maybe you can't print the particular type of plastic you need for an experiment. Um, then they started doing things like setting up the, like taking waste products from the lab and using it to make uh, racks for their pipette men. And then people started making the pipette men. So there's a couple different versions of this kind of on the open source market now. Um, some of them, like this one, I think use a balloon as the, the diaphragm. Some use a, a condom. Some have been published in the peer-reviewed literature and gotten them down to like micro pipetting range. Like really good high quality instruments that normally cost in the thousands to hundreds of dollar range that again you can print for almost nothing. Uh, you can make custom things that don't necessarily need to be complex, but they need to be special for you. So you have a particular type of experiment, you're throwing in a sonicator, it needs to be able to be held there, there's nothing on the market that holds it, it's easy to, to make these types of prints. Um, then for things that, again, aren't on the market, let's say you're doing an ultrasonic experiment and you need a clamp, you can't 3D print the material, you can 3D print the mold and then cast the material that you need to make. And if you look at this setup, almost all the parts are 3D printed in addition to the part that was printed as a mold to make the 3D printed component. <coughs> One of the most powerful things about having a digital design for a scientific experiment is that if you do the design right, you not only solve your problem, but you solve everybody else's problem. So one of the, the problems we have in solar cell research is deciding whether sunlight came directly from the sun or whether it came from like, you know, bouncing off the clouds or maybe off the ground as an albedo effect. And so we want to know the direct and diffuse radiation. And the way to do that is you have two pyranometers. One, you just stick outside measure all the global sunlight, everything that hits it. The other one, put a shadow band in front of, and it basically casts a shadow on the pyranometer for the track of the sun. These shadow bands cost a couple hundred dollars, and there is nothing special about them. It is just something that is in the way of the path of sunlight. But in the past, the way one would deal with an overly expensive shadow band is you would custom make one You'd maybe send out the design drawing to a machine shop, and they'd make yours that would fit your pyranometer and would be good for your location on the globe. And what I did here, and this is like my terrible coding skills, um, using OpenSCAD to make every shadow band for every pyranometer for all of time on any planet. And it only uses a couple relatively simple variables. So this is just calling out variables the same way you do in C or in any other programming language. And very, very simple geometries make this shape. Then you change any of these. If you need a wider one, a thinner one, a bigger one, if you have a different way to, to connect it to your pyranometer, it doesn't matter what it is. You change those, it'll automatically kick out the design. You export the STL, send it to a 3D printer, and now you have a shadow band that fits everybody's problem. And this is where things are really taking off, where people are starting to do the designs for everyone, not just themselves. To make things even easier, uh, Thingiverse, which uh, used to be controlled by an open source company and is now closed, put on a customizer app. So people that are uncomfortable with the code can, the, can then get on this application that reads in the OpenSCAD codes and prints out this nice little menu that's easy for people to use. Now unfortunately, the last time I checked Thingiverse the customizer was down, which is somewhat sad because there's been lots and lots of designs that have been coded in a way that are customizer compliant. And so what we did is we made a, a free one. So if anybody is using OpenSCAD for any of your projects and you want to make it available, like uh, you've probably heard of the Enabling Hand project where they have 3D printing uh, custom uh, prosthetics for children and 
you know, this is something that the RipRap community has really gotten into. Lots of people have done it. They have a customizer for one of the specific hands. Well, now with this, they can download it and do it for every, every hand without doing any extra work. And so if you have something there, you want a custom project, you can use our code to make your own customizer for anything that is written in, in OpenSCAD. And there is lots and lots of things that are out there. Uh, because this is kind of where my group started was making optomechanical pro uh, products, uh, we do all of our stuff in OpenSCAD. So something like uh, that little filter, the chopper, uh, when you do an optical uh, electronic experiment and you're doing a new material, you don't know exactly what the right chopping frequency would be. And so each one of those costs around 25 to $50, and you have a whole box of them, and you try one after another until you get the right signal to the no noise ratio. Well, now with 3D printing, you can print out any chopping ratio that you want. You can do double. You can do whatever you want with it. And the same with every type of lens holder, mirror holder. Um, we also discovered, if you look, let's see, down at the bottom of this, there's a optical table. And has anybody ever bought one? They're obscene. You can get a small car for the price of an optical table. And all it is is a piece of metal with screw holes mm -hmm. drilled into it that are all evenly spaced apart. And the idea is when you set up your optical experiment, it's holding everything in place, and it's exact. So you're for sure there's no error at all in any of the dimensions. But when you're actually setting up an optical experiment, one of the really hard parts is you've got all these stupid holes in exactly the right place, and maybe sometimes you want it like halfway in between where the holes are. And so you end up doing all of these cheats, and you end up putting in optical rail systems. And so we just happened to have a bunch of fake wood steel desks. So it was actually steel, but it had wood on top of it. And so we started to make all of our optical components with magnets at the bottom so that we could move them around. And a magnet holds something in exactly the right place, and you can move it anywhere that you want. So you have more degrees of freedom, you have more control over your optical experiments, and it costs far, far less. And so for doing things like an optical rail, where you have to make sure something's in a straight line, you can buy an optical rail at $380 a meter, or you can use OpenBeam, which is an open source aluminum extrusion, for $12 a meter. Exactly the same functional purpose, much, much, much less money, and completely using an open source tool chain. All of these devices and everything that we've tried is on the order of 97 to 99% savings. The more 3D printing you do, the closer you are to that, almost completely free. And with some of the most extreme examples, I got a quote for a $1,000 lab jack. A lab jack is the exact same thing as a car jack, only it can't lift up as much weight. There is no reason in the world it needed to be $1,000. And in my case, I was just moving a solar cell up in the path of the light and bringing it down. I didn't need it to be perfect. I just needed it to go up and down. And so this one is $5, made by another high school student. And you can, if you look at this closely, this is usually in a lot of rep wrap part discards that we had left over sitting around in the lab. We posted this on the web, and it was like by far the least expensive lab jack out there. And someone from Poland that I've never met, and I have no idea who it is, wrote back and was like, this is really good, but if you change this geometry around, you'll be able to get larger extension, and it'll be more accurate. Printed out his changes, did it. What do you know? He was right. It was, thank you. That took exactly one day to get a better product out of it that he would have never been able to do in our loan lab. We were not specialists in lab jack design. Who knows what this person actually said the day job was, but it was helpful to us. And now everybody, since then, now there are completely 3D printable lab jacks that are even more impressive than this and cost less money, and certainly for doing our types of experiments are more than, than adequate. Uh, there's lots, <laughs> lots more. So let's say you're, you need to make your own uh, lenses. There's now 3D printable grinding machines. Uh, if you need to do like micro manipulations, so say you know my macro manipulation is not good enough for you, well you can go to micro. Uh, there's also kinematic optical mounts, and so you can do the precise positioning that you need for any type of laser experiment. Uh, if you're taking, if you have old style microscopes and you want to turn them into digital microscopes, every single camera and cell phone on the market now has a 3D printable version that also is compatible with every single type of old microscope because everybody was scratching their own itch. Everybody was just doing the one that fixed their particular machine, and now all of us are covered. Um, but the real power is when you start taking the 3D printable objects and combining them with the open source electronics. And so one of the simplest cases is this open source colorimeter. Um, in our case, we were looking at it for uh, water quality measurements. And we made this simple 3D printable case, open source electronics, compared it to an off-the-shelf one that cost two grand, 
ours again on the order of fifty dollars just as good in every way that you could ever want it to be but our the, the users were irritated because this looks not quite good enough to put in those labs for my lab we don't mind if there's some wires hanging out the electronics are sitting there on the bench but they were like eh, you know no real scientist is going to use this so we take the next step and so this and if we're doing the next step we might as well make it a little bit better and so this is taking that same calorimeter, adding nephilometry, and so now you have a completely kind of open source water quality testing tool that can do turbidity and sort of dissolved, let's say, oxygen in the water to look for water quality, and it's portable, so it's battery powered, and you can take it anywhere in the world. And so by making a very, very tiny, slight changes to the code, like the core box is the same, but the code to do the rest of the case and put in everything internally was just a little bit more work adding one more LED to add the new functionality added a few pennies to the actual cost. And now it's not replacing one $2,000 device, it's replacing two $2,000 devices in one integrated device. So this got a little bit of notice. And uh, the nitrogen elimination company contacted us about making a photometer to work with their enzymes. So this is an interesting example of how you can work with a for-profit company that sells the product that you're open sourcing and they still want it to happen. You can say, well, why would somebody that's selling photometers want us to make a really cheap, inexpensive, open source one to let everybody do it? Well, it's because how they make their money. So they were selling photometers on the order of a couple hundred dollars, and they were selling a few of them, but they make their real money in selling the enzymes to do the nitrate testing. And the nitrate testing is for water quality, soil quality, um, for farmers so they know how much more fertilizer to put down, uh, for people that are feeding cows to make sure the forage isn't going to kill them. Um, it has all these applications, and their use of enzymes eliminated the use of mercury, but they needed a good high-quality colorimeter to be able to compare that to the quality that you get from a lab. So normally, let's say you're, you have a multi-million dollar farm, and you're going to make sure you're going to put in the right amount of uh, fertilizer, you need that number to be exact. And so it's not good enough just to use like some little nitrates test strips, you send it to a lab. And so they wanted lab quality tests that could be done uh, with their enzymes. So we developed this, and it's very, very similar to uh, two slides ago. Uh, it's handheld, and it, it's not good enough to have you know, connecting it to a computer. So we made it work with uh, any Android device. And so now we're getting lab quality nitrate results on something that's open source and around on the order of $50 of cost. And then they made a commercial one. And if you look closely at that, you can see 3D printing lines. Well, how do they? make it, well they bought a little spot and started 3D printing them, and they still sell them for about the same amount, so it's around $250, but this is completely open source, including the software which the company wrote. Why did they do that? Because they can sell more enzymes. So if a school that wouldn't be able to afford their fancy $250 one can make one themselves for $50, and then they're still buying the enzyme kits to be able to do, say, test the local water quality, everybody wins. And so if you could find that niche where you maybe are selling a secondary supply, like in this case, enzymes, uh, you can still have open source hardware that everybody gets to benefit from and build off of. And already somebody has made a phosphate tester that's based on the same architecture, so you can do nitrates and phosphates. And eventually we're gonna get to being able to test every single uh, contaminant in, in water. Um, other 3D printing open source hardware companies like Pax Instrument sell something that again, you could download and completely replicate their electronics, completely replicate everything. But like we use these in our labs for all the thermal testing because it's less expensive than what you'd buy commercially normally and all the codes available. So if we want to do any kind of specific custom experiment, we can go in there and hack it. It's like a hackable scientific tool that's available. I'm willing to pay more money for something like this, not less, because it's something that I can do exactly what I want with. Um, one of the Workhorses in our lab, and this, this particular device probably saved us the most money ever. Uh, it's a laser welding system. Uh, we had this project, we were developing a solar water pasteurizer. And the, the market research said that we had to get the cost down to $25. So the idea is you'd have contaminated, biologically contaminated water in the developing world. Sunlight comes down, heats it up, it reaches a pasteurization temperature, flows through a heat exchanger after opening a thermostatic valve heats the dirty water coming in with the uh, clean hot water coming out, and you have safe drinking water to, to drink. We got devices to work, prototyped them, they, they were beautiful. The heat exchangers are $250, made out of metal, cheapest thing we could find on the market. There's no way this is ever gonna work. 
And so we started looking around. It's like, well, can you make a polymer heat exchanger? That doesn't really necessarily make that much sense, but if the polymer's thin enough, maybe you could get away with it. And so we, we got some funding, and we went to, to have it prototyped. No one in the US could do it. We went to this German company that did it. And the, proto the original plastic prototype was $2,500. <laughs> And, you know, of course it would cost less in mass manufacturing and all this, but this was so expensive that for us to do multiple prototypes, like this was going to burn through our budget in seconds. So we started looking around for how could we make multiple different types of heat exchangers with plastic and test them. And there was a Canadian graduate student that had published a laser cutter online. And so we took his designs and we modified them a little bit uh, to use this fiber laser to make a polymer laser welder. And now we are making heat exchangers that are just as good as the $250 metal one for 25 cents using, and I'm not kidding, garbage bags. So taking garbage bags, plastic, laser welding the lines, and making heat exchangers that are actually functional. And these are not just good for the solar water pasteurizing project, but then since then, we've been making them for all different kinds of things, for uh, heat recovery ventilation systems in vehicles, for big, small, like secondary stage uh, cooling lines on thermal power plants. And so this device, every time we turn it on, saves us a couple thousand dollars. And, you know, we can run hundreds of prototypes in a day because it's relatively fast and easy to use. Uh, we're not the only ones doing open source hardware design. The Open Source Space Agency has an ultrascope, and for any of you uh, that are interested in, in joining the organization that is trying to track every single interstellar object that might smash into Earth at any time, no matter how big or small, you can now do this. So this is research grade quality, top of the line work that is powered with your cell phone, many, many 3D printable components. Uh, other people have developed Raman spectrometers and a basic ellipsometer. If anyone wants to work on a spectroscopic ellipsometer, talk to me afterwards. It's on my list of things to do. Uh, every type of weather station, piece of equipment from, say, rainwater measurement to wind gauges, all of that's been 3D printable open source designs anyone can download. Uh, Public Labs is a nonprofit <coughs> group in the US that specializes in citizen science. And so they have, they have a whole line of spectrometers and they're getting better and better and better. This is their latest one that's 3D printable that attaches to your cell phone, all open source software so you can point it at whatever you want to, get a spectrum. As more and, people, more and more people are adding spectrums to their database, it's getting better and better and more valuable to everybody interested in doing citizen science. A microscope is something that is relatively common in most labs. And so lots of people have been working on good, high-quality open source microscopes. One of the, the kind of leaders is the University of Cambridge, and they have a couple different models. And these are for if you're doing serious microscopy work, you need a good, solid tool, uh, you can use this design. And these are, whether it's OpenBeam or another uh, kind of T-channel uh, lock extrusion, you could 3D print these, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, but other groups are taking it far farther. Uh, the open flexure microscope is powered by a Raspberry Pi. It's almost 100% 3D printable. It's a good, high-quality microscope that they're using in Africa now in medical, like, for to in actual medicine. It is more than good enough. Uh, and this, again, has evolved over years of lots of people contributing to the, the design of it. One of my favorite ones is this one. This is a Canadian one. Um, it's all 3D printable except for the lenses that you can get from Walgreens. And I don't know if you have something equivalent here, but all the disposable cameras, you know, you take them to like a convenience stop, they take the whole thing, develop your film, and throw out the rest of it. Well, in those cameras is a lens. So they have tons of lenses that they're just normally throwing out. He went and collected a bunch and threw them in here. And if you connect your cell phone to it, you now have a pretty good optical microscope for doing something like science education. Um, these are my tax dollars hard work. This came from a national lab, and this is probably the cheapest hack you can ever pull off, and I challenge anyone to beat it, um, for making a microscope. So this is just a, a clip that you 3D print out. It's like, I don't know, a penny in plastic with a single glass bead that's held in perfect configuration in the inside of it, and the size of the glass bead will determine the magnification, so you can get like 1,000, 10,000 X that, go, that is turning your cell phone into a digital microscope. It's amazing that it actually works. And the beads used to be sold for things like fancy paint jobs. So they, they come in giant buckets for you know tens of thousands of beads. And it's when they published this, the, the bead maker started to sell little vials for like $5 with you know hundreds of beads, more than you're ever going to make in microscopes. 
they developed a new product, a new method to sell their glass beads with much, much higher value, at least in the educational realm of microscopy, uh, because of sharing the open source 3D printable design. If you really want to get into microscopy with uh, 3D printable design, you can actually turn your 3D printer into a really good microscope. So this is our Delta printer design with a couple little hacks. So instead of using a belt-driven um, actuators on the, the, the axes, we're using screws. And we did that to prevent backlash because when you're moving a microscope to a location and then, say, I don't know, moving it to another location, moving it back, you want it to come back to the exact same point. And with belts, you've always got a little bit of gap in the teeth that it's, it's very hard to do that. And so with this microscope, uh, it's taking the place of a microscope stage that would be over usually just a large two-dimensional area. But in our case, we can do three dimensions. And so the beauty of this is you could take a biological sample that's pretty big, like hand-sized, scan over the entire surface at different levels, and then use open source software that's freely available and had already been done to do photo stitching and photo stacking. So photo stitching is you get an entire image of the whole thing, and then photo stacking is what you see here, where you know, you're sort of looking at the back of the object, the front of the object, and you stack up a whole bunch of images, and then you have the whole image from the top to the bottom in perfect, high resolution, nice, clean, crisp image. And you can do this over giant areas. And so this is a type of microscopy that's never even really been done yet because it's so expensive just to get the two-dimensional stages. This whole device is under $1,000. Uh, and there's two versions, of course. There's the down version where you put on a USB microscope. And then there's the up version where you might have a really nice microscope already, but you don't have a two-dimensional stage for it or you don't have a good stage, you don't have an automated stage. And now you just take the thing, flip the things up, and just like we were doing, say, the, the mill, um, you can put, it doesn't matter how heavy this is, this can be tons, um, and you get your, your microscope images from it. If we can use it for microscopy, why don't we start to use these 3D printers for other things, like mixing our chemicals or uh, for actual automation. So if you look at fluid handling robots in the biotech industry, tens of thousands of dollars, this is the same printer with a syringe pump, open source code, filling up a 9612 plate. It does everything the big boys can do um, for much, much, much less money. If you really want to make money, though, you have to go after the things that are hard to fabricate normally. So as an example of this is a slot die system. So all a slot die is is a small die where you push ink or something else through. It has kind of a, a variable geometry in here, and there's a ton of literature on exactly what shape this should be for exactly what type of fluid you're pushing through, and it pushes it out. So these are slot dies cut in half. Uh, this is the OpenSCAD code for it, and this is the, the 3D printed version of it where you're just printing half of it. And as you can see, you know, it's very easy to customize it. You can change whatever geometries you want on the inside. It's trivial. And then print it out. This is one completely printed out in uh, PET G, and it costs 25 cents. And the 25 cent there is to show you how expensive it is and how big it is. Normally, these cost four grand. And if you look at it, you can see why. Because if you're having a custom slot die made, that means someone's going to have to machine it and then weld two halves together. That's really complicated, very hard, especially if you want all those surfaces smooth on the inside. 3D printing, it's trivial. So you can print out your slot die, then attach it to this exact same printer, put on a 3D printable syringe pump, and now you can start to make nanometer size scale thin films with a completely 3D printable machine. And so this is old style 3D printer that we don't even use for 3D printing anymore because it's so old and rickety compared to the good stuff now um, that we've turned into a semiconductor processing piece of equipment that has saved on the order of 17,000% and that's just for the slot die, let alone the rest of the system. And so our, our end goal, in case it's not obvious yet, is because my group is a 3D printing group and a solar cell group, we want to be able to 3D print solar cells from scratch to power the 3D printers. And so we are slowly but surely stepping through the, the stages that we need to get there. Um, one of the other problems with, with RepRap is that for a long time it was almost completely focused on plastic. And you can do a lot with plastic, but there's some things you just can't do. And for that you need other materials, the ceramics or metals. And there was, there's been attempts to make RepRapable metal printing with uh, low melting temperature metals. You can use like indium um, or gallium. And that those, they are expensive and not very useful. Uh, because colleague pointed out, in America we could do anything, and there's no laws. <laughs> we got a MIG welder, any kind you have in your garage, 
We attached it to the 3D printer. Now I say this is the first, but this is actually the second. The first, we made out of scrap wood and we put aluminum foil all over. And the, we weren't, of course, sure this was going to work. So we had the best welder on campus, it was called John the Welder, come and hold the welding tool over the top of our upside down delta, still as steady as he could, sort of based off of the geometry and like he knew how to weld, so he knew about how far it had to be. And we ran the program with the stage underneath him and it worked. And then we said, we don't need John the Welder anymore. We can use this metal stand. <laughs> so put on the metal stand. We said, we're never going to be able to publish anything with wood and molten metal. And so we had 3D printable kind of uh, vertices the same way we would on our normal one that's made out of wood. And we replaced the wood with aluminum. And we started printing with steel. So this is one of the first functional objects that we came off with. This is the gear for a recycle bot that we used to run a um, windshield wiper motor to drive an auger to make recycled uh, 3D printing filament. And this is not pretty. I mean, the, this is resolution of multiple millimeters, mm -hmm. but it was good enough. Like, this is a steel object, this is solid, you would not want to get hit with it. Um, and since then, things have been evolving pretty quickly. So this is sort of the next generation of all metal 3D printer, all of it's open source, but it takes a machine shop to be able to put this together, and the quality got much, much better so that we could start to make functional things that we need in the lab, like something that can withstand the power of a Bunsen burner, which most of our plastics can't, um, that works just fine. And then realizing that most people <coughs> wouldn't feel comfortable doing this. Um, this is using the same electronics that you would use for our normal Delta printers. It actually costs less to make something like this than a plastic one if you exclude the cost of the welder, because the head is one of the most expensive components of a 3D printer. Uh, we replaced everything with a CNC router part kit. So this is kind of like for a hobbyist that wants to build a router, this is where you would start. And all we did to it was replace the head with a welder. Um, and then all the open source code for the slicing and the control of the machine, all that is, is freely available. And we're now down to resolutions of under a millimeter with all the steels. We've also done a whole bunch of aluminums. And for aluminum, it's a little bit more challenging, so it's around two millimeters. And the strength and the porosity is better than you get with normal processes. And the real kind of beauty of this is that you can start to think about making metal objects where you design the interior of the object for the actual load that it's going to bear. The same way that we can now with plastic, where you can change the infill parameters. So anybody that's worked with 3D printers here knows that one of the biggest problems is time. You don't want to spend hours waiting for your 3D print to make. And so you reduce that infill percentage as much as you can to still get the mechanical properties that you need. Well, in metal, everybody's been cutting things out of solid metal for so long, we haven't been thinking about doing that. Now we can make hollow metal objects, and that's what's happening, what I call the high church with metal 3D printing, <coughs> where you have an EOS system that costs half a million dollars, you need to put it in a blast room because it's dealing with a bunch of powdered metal that's explosive, and that, so you're looking at like a million dollars to have a good metal 3D printing tool. This is now kind of garage ready, and if you need metal for your experiment, this is very close to showtime now, and for anybody that's comfortable with anything next door, you're ready for this. This is not that bad. The only thing that I will warn you about that we didn't know off the, the first hand is, you know when you, you're welding, you're in a mask and shield it up, covered in leather. Well, we're not anywhere near the welder, so I had my student is typing on the computer, writing up his thesis as the metal welder is going, and after the first couple days, we noticed that the entire side of his face was red. And UV radiation burns. So you must have a, a curtain or something between you and the, the welder. Um, we learned that the hard way. Now everybody else can be safe. Uh, the other thing that we learned about this, we were talking about emissions from 3D printers. Uh, if you're printing in steel, it's basically safe. We do all, all this work in a hood. Uh, but for stainless steel, the emissions are actually quite nasty. And so you, you don't want to be in the room when that's happening. Uh, but this can print in stainless steel as well. So basically, everything that you can buy metal for welding for now. Uh, the, these formulations have gone through centuries of, of improvement are now actually pretty good. And so uh, those work, and then we've been developing new alloys to, to maybe make them a little bit better. OK. The power is making something that you want to fit your exact experiment. And so we were doing syringe pumps because we were interested in using for 3D printing, but it turns out the scientific community uses them for all kinds of things. Uh, chemists use them for electrospinning, biologists use them to feed rats, all different kinds of stuff. And so the syringe pumps on the market are actually pretty expensive, 
But you can make a 3D printable one, and these, again, is written in OpenSCAD, so it'll fit any syringe, any type of motor. Uh, you just punch in what you have, and it'll spit out what the results are, you 3D print it. And then, because we were trying to be more fancy, we moved away from the Arduino and used a Raspberry Pi. The beauty of this is the Raspberry Pi is like a mini Linux computer, really. And so you could run your experiments from home. And so now we no longer necessarily need to be in the lab to do the experiments. And that was the same technique that we then used for the metal 3D printers. So we don't have to sit there getting our sunburn. We can be somewhere else um, and monitoring it by uh, like a camera on our computers. And so this came out. This paper is very popular. Lots of people started using it. And, but they didn't like this. And so again, it was a student that was like, why didn't you just use an Arduino? So he made an Arduino version, put it back up online. That's actually now more popular than our original version because people would rather be, have control over the experiments right there in front of them and they didn't want the chance of hacking or anything else. Um, to give a feel for scientific funders, why this is so potentially powerful, we did, we ran the economics on it, but we just didn't run the economics on like, oh look, we saved some money <coughs> making our own bridge pump. Uh, because we had developed it, we knew exactly how much it cost. So it was around $30,000 of time for a student, an uh, undergraduate student, a PhD student, and our research staff person and a little bit of my time kind of like cheerleading them on, including our 52% overhead. I don't know, in France, do you have overhead for grants? They really, grants? Yeah, they take the money away. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so in America, 52% gone before you see a single dollar. And so the, the, that includes the overhead in it. So this is like real. This is like as if the NSF gave us 30 grand, we can develop this uh, um, little syringe pump for it. You go on the market and the absolute cheapest, barest bones, worst syringe pump you can buy is made in China, falls apart after the first day, it's $153. A good one, say like a double syringe pump like the one shown here, is over two grand. So the, within the first year of us publishing the designs that had been downloaded a thousand times, which means at the very least it saved $168,000 if people were replacing these ones, uh, or up to 2.5 million if they were actually doing something like this. So realistically, we saved the scientific community a million dollars in that first year. And how can I be so confident about this? Well, it's because of the nature of how we were calculating that downloaded substitution value. The only thing we don't know, we know how much it costs to make them, we know how much it costs to replace uh, something that's available commercially, we just don't know if people actually made them. But sort of like MP3s, there is no reason to ever download a file unless you're going to make it. So man, just making the very simple assumption that for each file downloaded, people made one syringe pump. And that's actually pretty conservative. So yes, there are a few people that maybe downloaded it and decided it was too complicated and threw it away. Uh, but a lot of people, if they downloaded it and it was somebody that using something in like the, the biology labs in our building, they downloaded and made a bunch of them. They then shared the files with their friends who made a bunch more. And so realistically, the return on investment, if the NSF had funded us to make the syringe pump for this purpose of open sourcing it, was at least 750% and up to 12,000%. Since then, it's been downloaded over four times more, so we're looking at at least $4 million of value for a $50,000 investment. And that's why I'm a strong proponent of starting to fund people, not necessarily me, people that are specialists in the particular type of technology that is being used by scientists, fund them to make open source scientific tools for all of us to use. To see how powerful this is, I have a cartoon here of the standard scientific funding model and the open source model. And what we're doing here is we're taking a million dollars, we're dividing it up over 10 years, and we're giving out $100,000 grants, or 100,000 euro grants. And in the standard model, if you look at this, you have 10 scientists here, nine are very unhappy because they spent months writing a grant proposal that was not funded. One person's very happy because they got their money, and with that $100,000, they bought a black box. They don't know exactly how the tool works. They have a pretty good idea. They trust the manufacturer. It's been vetted. It's probably OK. Um, and they stick their samples in. They get an answer that comes out, and they can trust it. You'll also notice that the happy person has white hair. Uh, in America, and I don't know if this is true in France, your probability of winning a grant from like the NIH or the NSF on a single investigator grant, like a single person, is less than 6% which is pretty, like, even if you're cocky, you're like, oh, I'm four times better than the average scientist, that still gives you a 25% chance of winning the grant. So you don't win the grants unless you have established track record, you've got lots of funding before, you can put, we have, like, in the NSF, it's really, I don't know what the right word is, it is obscene. You have to put in a facilities characterization, which is basically a brag sheet of all the stuff you've ever bought. 
and say, look, if you give me this $100,000, I can put $20 million of equipment to use. But if you don't, then it's all just going to sit there. And so the chances of winning the grants as you become more established go up and up and up. And if you're a young researcher that just got your PhD, there's a couple little pots of money, like a career award for early researchers that you are the only ones that can apply for. But the big money, the monster grants, you're going to need somebody on, like here on your team. And so you usually have to team up. The young assistant professors write the grant. The old people say, eh, it looks like a good idea. I'll put my name on this. And then you have a, a shot. And so in the standard model, 90% of your scientists are unhappy, and they wasted all their time writing that grant proposal. Now, in the open source model, the same thing happens. You're still only going to fund one person. It's still going to be somebody really established. But if you look, instead of a black box, it's an open source box. And they also weren't funded to buy something. They were funded to make something. So they got a little wrench in their hands. And when they, on that first year, after they made the design, they get the thing that they wanted. But then they have to share it with everybody else. And that's where year 2 through 10 starts to get really interesting. So on the proprietary side, year 2 through 10, you only have one person happy in each, each case. But in the open source side, that second year, because we know that the open source equipment at the very most costs 10% of what the proprietary version is, everybody's funded. So everybody's happy. In fact, you start to give people little wrenches and give them extra money to make it better. And if they make it better, they get a star on their piece of equipment. So in the, the, the second year, a couple people get stars and everybody's funded. By the 10th year, everybody has a star. Everybody has the better equipment. Why? Because they're publishing the open source code for the design that everybody, if you need it, you're just going to download, print, put it on your tool. If you add everything up, after 10 years, in the proprietary case, you've got 10 scientists funded with 10 tools. One of those tools is 10 years old. Look at the cell phone in your pocket. Imagine what it was like 10 years, like what it will be like 10 years from now. You know, we're probably going to have virtual reality. It probably will be embedded in your skin by then. Like, this, these are sad tools. You're not writing top of the line scientific equipment anymore with this. You're not writing the, the nature and science papers. Most of these, except for maybe the last two, are already obsolete. 90% of your scientists are unfunded. In the open source hardware case, it's not perfect. So you're funding 91% of the scientists, but their equipment is all up to date. It's all state of the art. It was only made, the, the upgrades were made basically for the cost of materials that were put into them. And the return on investment for doing it this way is over 800,000%. Because of arguments like this, um, science funders in the United States are actually starting to take this stuff seriously. And because I wrote some of the earlier papers on this, I get to review the grant proposals. And in the, the olden days, there was none. Now it's like, oh, this is too many for me to look at. Like, somebody else needs to do this. This is becoming really popular because it's known that if you want people to replicate your work and follow on it, one of the best ways is just to share it with them so they can use the same tools. And so we de developed kind of a policy framework to get started in any country. And so the first one is to look at it from a national perspective. What makes the most sense to, for the national government of a particular country to work on open sourcing first? And so I'm doing this uh, Fulbright in Finland, which is really fantastic. And it's nice to be in a country where everything is like logical and crisp. Um, so when I pitch this idea, they're like, yes, good idea, go, function, do. And uh, we looked at the equipment that was purchased by Alto University in the $10,000 range and above, or 10,000 euro range and above. And the, the reason that we were doing that is a lot of the, the low-hanging fruit, the cheap stuff, the $100 tools, the $2,000 tools, there's already open source versions of that. And if you need something for your lab, just go on to Yegi and type in whatever you're looking for. There's probably somebody that's taken a poke at it already. It might not be exactly what you want. It's probably not good enough. But it's enough to get you started. It's enough to hand to your students to make awesome. Um, but for the expensive stuff, like a scanning electron microscope, there are millions of dollars, very complicated. You're going to need to put several PhDs on it. This is not something that you can do in your garage by yourself. You're going to need some people. It needs funding to do that. And so we looked at all the Alto University purchases. And it came out from kind of the, what made the most sense for them were scanning electron microscopes and uh, uh, TMs. So two types of microscopes on the high end and atomic layer deposition systems. So it just so happens that Finland developed the ALD system and that's what I went there to, to try to do is to make a 3D printable atomic layer deposition system. So we're still in the, the works on it now, but that should soon come out and then you'll be able to, you know, I don't think there's any ALD system on this campus. There's only one at Michigan Tech that I was really fortunate to be able to purchase on eBay. And in the future, the hope is that everybody that wants one, everybody that wants to make conformal, uh, nanostructured, thin films of semiconductors or metals or ceramics will be able to do that using ALD chemistry that's already developed and a really inexpensive tool. So the next 
after you've figured out what you need, uh, the next is to get funding for it. And one of the approaches that, that people are using in these great applications is if they want their tool or their method to be used by a lot of people, is they'll open source it. And that gives their students the opportunity to make businesses still and sell it, while at the same time getting it laterally moved to as many places as they possibly can. And like this Fab Lab model is brilliant for this. Because if you can do it in one Fab Lab, you can do it in all the other Fab Labs tomorrow. Um, the next is a free online catalog of validated scientific FOSH. And there's two approaches to this ongoing right now. Uh, the NIH, which is our big health um, investor, has the 3D printing exchange. And when it started, it was basically a place where you put models of protein so that you could kind of look at it and see what it was. But now they have a custom labware section. So if you want a good, solid tool that was put there by a scientist that was probably used in a peer-reviewed publication, you go there, look for it, and this is where the kind of uh, the adults are playing in the 3D printing world, and it's funded by the U.S. government, 100%. Uh, and there's no screen on it, so as soon as it's up there, it's up there for everybody. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good, high quality. And so the other approach is more and more open source scientific hardware is passing through the peer review system. In the olden days, there was a couple instrumentation journals, and you might see, like, say, the Journal of Microscopy might have the designs for a microscope here and there. But now there's journals dedicated to open source hardware. Hardware X is the one that I'm a co-founding editor of. It's sponsored by Elsevier, so the largest scientific publisher. Uh, they are uh, putting all their weight behind it. And so this is an open access journal, and the idea is that it's, it'll be tied to all their other journals so that when you download something, you download a PDF, you think the experiment's good, you want to replicate it, you click on their supplementary material section, it sends you to HardwareX, where it's a validated open source hardware design, and I can assure you, as the editors, we are making sure it's open source. So you don't get in the journal unless you provide all the code for everything. Your CADs, your electronic schematics, your code, all of it has to be there, or else you can't uh, kind of play in our sandbox. And so this is well on its way to becoming real, and I, my goal is that you know, within our lifetimes, you know, like the next generation of scientists, if you see something that you assign, an experiment you want to do, you'll be able to download it, go to the Fab Lab, make it, and do the experiment the next day. And that's something that like my generation just didn't exist. There was no chance of that ever happening. Now, the fourth step is a little bit more challenging. And this is to change government purchasing policies. So if you really want to win in the US scientific market, you've got to change the policy on how you purchase things. And so the goal here will be to say, look, if there's something that's open source and it's available on the market and you want to buy the proprietary version, you can, but you have to justify it if you're being funded by the federal government. And that's exactly the kind of wording they use to get us to buy all different kinds of things, like the $300 toilet seats. Um, and now this would actually be saving money rather than uh, using more of it. Uh, the next one is uh, support a makerspace at all public universities. Uh, and I should say makerspace or fab lab. That is well on its way. So. A few years ago, they weren't very common. Now, all major universities, like if you want to attract engineers, you've got to have something, a fab lab, a makerspace, a hackerspace, something where people can actually use uh, the facilities to work on their own projects. And that's the community and the university students. It was really sad. When I started at Michigan Tech, we have a whole big bunch of machine shops, but there wasn't a single place on campus where if you had an idea as a person, you couldn't go make it. It had to be part of a design team had to be part of senior design. You weren't allowed to make anything on your own. Now we've got a makerspace. Now we've got labs where you can actually fabricate your own things, just, just like here. And that is extremely empowering, particularly for young engineers that have like, real prototypable ideas and that are ready to do it. And then the last one, and this we've also made a lot of headway, is to put at least one 3D printer in every school so that when young children are, have an idea and they want to try to make something of their own, they have access to the tool to do it. And this is probably, this is where uh, one of our biggest success stories. So we've been doing these 3D printing workshops for high school teachers. And the way we did it the first year is we knew we didn't want to, we had them come to campus, we taught them how to build a rep rack, and then we sent the rep rack back with them. And our thinking was we wanted to have two teachers because it's a pretty com like complex, uh, really tight class, <laughs> happened really fast, and we didn't think one person might forget some of the steps and not be able to, to take care of the printer when it went back. We didn't want this thing where you'd learn how to build a 3D printer, make one, take it back, and it would just gather dust. And so we had two teachers come, and we thought this, we thought we solved it. And everybody made 3D printer work at the end of the day. It was really, really <coughs> gratifying. They were excited, it was, it, was, it was happy. And then we started hearing these complaints coming back from the schools. 
And the complaint was the teachers were fighting over the 3D printer. They both wanted to use it for their class. And of course, they're slow, so there's like a, uh, arguments ensued. So since that first 3D printing class, we've done all of them where one person per printer. Still two teachers, but you both walk away with the printer, so everybody's happy and nobody gets upset. And this, this kind of first cohort of college students has just started coming in that have been trained on our 3D printers. We basically <laughs> saturated the, the market for all of northern Michigan. Like if you go to high school in northern Michigan, you're going to see one of our 3D printers, probably several of them. And so we started to see students that have been trained on our 3D printers using OpenSCAD, using the completely open source RepRap tool chain, and they are stellar. Like they're like master students. They already know how to do what we need to get done. We can put them on projects immediately and they can go. And that, when that happens everywhere for every discipline, well, we are really going to start cooking. So this is the future. This is what I hope to do. This is why I went to, to Finland, was to learn how to make these solar cells uh, with atomic layer deposition to, to kind of take that extra little boost of efficiency. And someday, their method section was pretty good. You know, in the typical scientific paper, the shortest section of the paper is the method section. And if you tried to replicate that experiment and you were able to do it, like you're a saint, like it's not usually humanly possible. Um, with this, now you're gonna have everything. The bill of materials, the CAD designs, electronics, build instructions, firmware, software, recipes, data, the whole kit and caboodle, so that people can really start to stand on the shoulder of giants. And to give you a feel for how powerful this can be, this was one of the first papers uh, that we published in Hardware X, was a shaker mixer. And so this is a $30 um, system that's powered by batteries you could put into a refrigeration system or a, uh, an environmental control chamber that just spins around and mixes your chemicals for you. And it's replacing something that costs $500 without shipping on the market, the closest available version. Ours, of course, is better because it's customizable, so you can put whatever type of test tube holes you want in it. You can change the speed. You can do anything that you want to it. And then we, the, what we needed, actually, for that semiconductor printing thing is we needed something to shake the chemicals, too. And we didn't want to make our 3D, printable, 3D printer into a shaker just for that. It seems like a little bit of a waste. And so we added a, a small Arduino to this and added shaking capabilities. So by changing this rocker switch, you could change from spinning around or shaking. That replaces a $1,000 tool. And so it costs a little bit more money, but nowhere near the, the, with the extra that you're getting in terms of functionality. And so this device is used basically every day in my lab. It's open source, freely available. Hundreds of people have downloaded it. It's being used presumably all over the world to do exactly the same types of things uh, that we are. And so our goal is with 3D printing and open source hardware, you truly can stand on the shoulders of giants, not in some distant future, but like immediately. You download the file, print, and you're off to the races. So I want to thank everybody very much for, for having me here. Uh, any questions, you can email me. Everything I talked about is available uh, open, on an open source wiki. Um, I thank you very much for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, we have time so, for a couple of questions. Oh. Who's going to start? Yeah. Let, 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 yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, you know, so stimulating. And, uh, um, but when you are talking about open source, uh, it means that you have some sources. What is um, the process to get enough people, enough uh, researchers uh, to work together and to get uh, uh, a strong result about uh, creating a new product? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question from the kind of the social engineering standpoint. And I would say the vast majority of the scientific tools that I've, I've shown here have been developed in a single lab to solve a single problem for that particular research group. And then it's only after they've been posted to the kind of the source code yeah. that you then start to develop a community. And so for some things like the open trons, they've turned into products that then people are buying the product, making up new experiments, and then sharing it with the rest of the community. That's a successful way. And then there's also the kind of the pure open source way. So a lot of what we do is complementary to the RepRap community, which is very well established, I don't know, thousands of people all over the place that are trying to make better rapid prototyping for themselves and for their companies, and by, you know, they've reached critical mass. And that's one of the first kind of true, you know, that's not going away. There's too many companies that are kind of following the open source way with it now. Okay. Any 
together. I have one more. Uh, please. Yeah. Uh, what about the uh, reasons? I, I need uh, the same kind of uh, reasons that in software development, or there is other kind of uh, reasons, like uh, I don't know, for production or for business. Right. So, so the yeah, the I'd say the software model is really well established at this point. Um, it, it's gotten to the point now where, like for instance, a, a representative from Red Hat visited our campus and he was kind of um, telling my students the way people are recruiting now. And so for, for their company, it's an open source software company, they're obviously going to recruit open source software developers. Uh, but he was sitting next to a, a representative from Xerox. It's not particularly open source in their hardware company. And when students were coming up handing them their resumes, the, the Xerox guy was putting them in one pile or the other pile. And at the end of the career fair, he took the one pile in his hand and just dumped it all into a trash can. And the guy from Red Hat was like, well, how did you vet all those resumes so fast? And he's like, this stack, little stack, has GitHub accounts on it. And that means we can see what they can do, we know the quality of their work, and we can say whether we want to hire them or not. And anybody that hasn't contributed to the open source software development, we know, even though we're not particularly a software community or company, we, a lot of our work is in software, we want to see what we're buying. And so in the same way with hardware now, it's starting to get to the point where if you're going to hire a designer, you want to see what they've made. And I know for my own research group, uh, you know, I'm interested in people's grades and their GRE scores and that kind of thing. I'm really interested in what they've made before. And if they put together a 3D printer on their own and hacked it and done something that I haven't seen before, or if I've used their work in something that we've already done, you're going to get hired and I'm going to give you bonuses, I'm going to do everything I can to get you in my research group. And I think that's starting to happen in the, the, the corporate world as well, is that we're starting to really see the pull, not just the push. And so the, for the scientific community, right now there's a handful of good, solid devices. And I, I'm hoping that in the near future, they're ubiquitous to get to the point where it becomes the new standard. And then the best example we have now for open source hardware is 3D printing, where in the olden days it was all proprietary. And in the US we have Make Magazine, which is like a magazine just for makers, people that make stuff. And every year they have a 3D printing shootout where any 3D printing company that wants can send their printer, they give it to a relatively experienced user, takes it out of the box, plugs it in, and then prints a bunch of test things. And every year for the last couple of years it's been an open source company that's won usually bounces back and forth between Lulzbot in the US and Prusa in Europe. And they're both good quality, high quality solid printers. And you can see sort of like the war as like, one will come up with a new feature, then the other one will use it because it's open source. And then make another feature on top of it. And they just keep getting better and better and better. And everyone in that community, all the different open source 3D printing companies are doing the same thing. And so everybody's rising up and getting higher and higher quality. And the proprietary companies, like take Stratasys, the bot maker bot, which was the leading they're, they basically laid off all of their U.S., like they don't manufacture in the U.S. anymore. Their products are objectively not as good. They're, they can't compete with the rest of the development community because we just have more people. Uh, do you think that uh, if you look at it's uh, enough available to be used in healthcare, for example, because it seems to me that uh, now that, that's a good question, and, and uh, I think we don't have good data on a lot of it yet. So doing the long term, you know, like how long can say the axes on my 3D printers last? And I know like my oldest printers are still functioning, but does that mean that they have a five year lifespan? Well, we don't we don't know yet. They're only four years old. So like test test been done yet? They take a long time, and I think there's a lot of the part where scientific funders can really help is validating designs and putting them through like the environmental chamber test, the uh, accelerated, um, to prove that they can handle the rigorous testing environments. Now for the things that we use ours in, most of our actual testing, like the optoelectronic stuff, is in room temperature environment, controlled for dust, they, they, everything seems fine. Uh, for also, we're looking at bringing 3D printed equipment into the clean room, so we've been doing a lot of studies on particles that are coming off of them and what those particles are, how big they are, you know, is it going to contaminate the semiconductor processes, 
Um, and the good news is, at least so far with our test, is it looks pr very promising, as long as you clean it before it goes in the same way you would anything else, with the exception of the color. So a lot of the colorants are bozo no no metals <laughs> that you do not let anywhere near your, your silicon. And so um, that is a problem, because right now the vendors of filament don't know what is in their filament. One step back, and they still don't know what's in the filament. So uh, the best option is to use colorless, kind of virgin material and to test it yourself. And so we've done a bunch of the tests that will at least be helping the, the cleaner communities. But yeah, we still need that needs to be funded by somebody. So it's that's ample room for future grants uh, for maybe people to do that. Okay. So, merci beaucoup à tout le monde et à nouveau merci.